Following Dr. Miles will be the talk by Professor Mike Robinson, Director of Ironbridge International Institute for Cultural Heritage at the University of Birmingham. Professor Robinson's talk is titled Operational Strategies for Cultural Heritage, the Development of Cultural Roots. Following Dr. Miles will be the speech delivery given by Professor Mike Robinson, Director of Ironbridge International Institute for Cultural Heritage, University of Birmingham. The speech topic is Operational Strategies for Cultural Heritage, the Development of Cultural Roots. Hello there. I'm Mike Robinson. I'm the director of the Ironbridge International Institute for Cultural Heritage and also a professor and chair of cultural heritage here at the University of Birmingham. And I'm very sorry indeed that I can't be with you in person um, for your forum, the third forum on Asian industrial heritage conservation. But I know that it's important work that you do. And so I hope that within my short intervention, I can at least sort of stimulate some debate and help a little bit in formulating some ideas for the future. And today I want to talk to you about cultural roots. And cultural roots are becoming an important strategy for the cultural heritage sector. And I believe they are probably one of the best instruments, one of the best tools we have of making cultural heritage more meaningful to the general public and also for the very preservation of some cultural heritage that is very valuable to us. I want to talk about what I call the operational strategies for cultural heritage and how these cultural roots can help in strategizing, in making our cultural heritage um, more sustainable for the long term. And I'm going to take the example of Ironbridge. It's an example I obviously know well, but I also work with the European uh, Institute for Cultural Roots, which is a, a body of the Council of Europe. And I've worked with UNESCO on developing special cultural roots across Europe based on World Heritage Sites. And cultural roots take up a large part of my time now, and I'm very passionate uh, about what they can do. So what I'd like to start with is for us to consider some of the realities, some of the pressures that are on cultural heritage sites as we speak. Every type of cultural heritage, and I know that your interest is mainly on industrial heritage, and that's a particularly sort of interesting challenge. All heritage requires ongoing costs to conserve the site and to manage the site. And these costs don't go away. Um, management costs a lot of money now uh, opening sites up proper conservation of industrial heritage in particular can cost a lot of money indeed and of course as we know no matter where we are in the world there's increasing pressure on the funding for all types of cultural heritage whether that heritage is funded through the public sector or whether it's funded through the private sector or a combination between the two. And I guess within the UK, we've become um, uh, very used to having a what I call a, a mixed funding system. So with some funding from um, uh, the public sector, from governments directly, but also through the more independent, the charitable sector, 
private sector and a mix of different funding streams. I have to say that in my experience, as I go around the world, as I went around the world post the previous to this crisis, um, I'm always disappointed on the lack of what I would call sustainable management strategies that are in place for cultural heritage sites, whether they are archaeological sites, industrial sites, museums, or very big monumental sites, world heritage sites. Time and time again, managers and uh, ministries tell me we are existing on a day-to-day -day existence. We don't know where the next funding is coming from. All you need is for a, a disaster, such as the one that we are faced with in the moment, at the moment, um, and buildings fall down, tourists don't come, revenue streams are stopped. There's a crisis almost on a daily basis for many cultural heritage sites. But there are other pressures on cultural heritage sites. We need to engage with various audiences in, for cultural sites. Now, this can be tourists, um, which are a very important audience for all heritage sites, but also local communities. It's important that we involve our local communities properly in not just in the sort of the day-to-day the -day running of sites, but also in their long-term sustainable um, protection. And in particular, it's very important to engage with the younger generation. And this is a very big challenge from experience, I know, with the industrial heritage sector. As we have moved away from the industrial cultures which gave us industrial heritage, so younger people now see industrial heritage as something very distant in the past. They see themselves very disconnected with it. And that's not very good for the future. That doesn't bode well for the long term. And there's also a problem of what I would call fragmentation because we have a great many cultural heritage sites and they increase on a year by year basis. And this creates its own problems. And I'd like to pick up on this fragmentation issue in a little bit more detail. Because there are many positive aspects of having lots of small small scale cultural heritage sites. And in a sense, they have grown through the enthusiasm of um, local communities, of volunteers, of heritage enthusiasts. And they are very good at cementing local identities um, uh, and bringing something um, special into local communities. So there are many positive aspects of having lots and lots of little cultural heritage sites scattered around um, a region or a nation. But there, it also brings problems. Because when you have so many little heritage sites scattered around the place, we don't get any economies of scale. We don't have those ways of utilizing effectively the small resources that we need. And the other thing is, everybody's competing against everybody. Now, I can tell you that in Britain, I've always been surprised at why Britain is the birthplace of the railways, the sort of the real cradle of railway heritage doesn't have a World Heritage Site related to railways at all. And part of this is because we have 
so many different sites related to railway heritage, stations, um, uh, um, uh, production works, um, uh, old lines, locomotive restoration works, but they're very fragmented. They're not working together. They're not telling a, a holistic story. And so they are all competing for the same level of resource, very competitive. And of course the budgets for cultural heritage are sometimes very small and very fragile indeed. And I would suggest they are maybe too reliant on public sector funding. So when a crisis comes along in the health service or in the education service or, or a natural disaster, one of the first budgets to be cut is the cultural heritage budget. When you are just a small site fighting on your own, it's very difficult to compete with other sites. And you also, there's, you also get a sort of what I call the island effect, that you're very intensely in, engrossed in your own site but you're not seeing what's going on in the other sites, in your own region, your own country even, and certainly internationally. And so there is a lack of sharing and the lack of sort of sharing of expertise, not just in the technical aspects of heritage, but in the management aspects of heritage. And that's why I think the, uh, the, the forum, the Asian International Forum is so important because it should be the organization which does engender uh, collaboration and sharing of expertise and knowledge. And this brings me on to another issue with regard to the small scale and the, and the fragmented cultural heritage sector. And that is, it's difficult for small organizations to be heard politically. And uh, whether we like our politics or not, we have to be represented in a particular way. And having lots of little small cultural sites is sometimes very difficult to get our voice heard um, uh, when there's lots of bigger voices asking for resources, asking for help around. And there's another dimension I would point to with regard to the fragmentation of sites. And that relates to the audience. And we have a, a saying in the English language, and perhaps there's a similar saying in Mandarin, that we can't see the wood for the trees. We're so busy looking at what's in front of us, we don't see the bigger picture. And that sometimes leads the audience, whether it's tourists or whether it's just local visitors, even the local community, confused sometimes in terms of the meaning of the heritage. And we're missing out the bigger story. We don't see the bigger picture. And this is where I think cultural roots are important. And I'm going to pick on one route, but I could have picked on many routes because the principles are very similar. And the route I'm going to look at is the European route of industrial heritage. Now, this is, a, I hope, in sort of interesting to, for, for this audience, but it's interesting for me because um, uh, because of the Ironbridge connection, but also my interest and my passion for industrial heritage around Europe. Now, the European route for industrial heritage started life in about 1999, something like that. And it started as a network, a very loose network. And it was, it had some funding from the European Union, and it was basically there to help promote tourism to industrial sites, because industrial sites are not always at the top of the tourist list. And recently, um, uh, two years ago, it was validated 
as one of the 38 validated Council of Europe's cultural routes. There are 38 of these special cultural routes which go through a process of validation um, uh, and evaluation um, every three years and to get the title, to get the brand of Council of Europe cultural route. And the European route of industrial heritage now falls part of that Council of Europe family of cultural routes. And you can look this up on the uh, Council of Europe's website, just Google cultural routes and there's a lot of information there. The European route of industrial heritage has about 1,850 sites taken from countries across the whole of Europe. And they are sites of different sizes. Some are very big monumental sites, which you will have heard of. Some are very small localized sites. But the very fact that we have a cultural route allows themes and sub themes to be developed from different parts of that route. Now those could be sub routes based upon um, geography in terms of a route within a country, but importantly, they relate to sites which are thematically defined. So we can talk about sub routes to do with canal systems, sub routes to do with just coal mining, sub routes to do with ironstone mining. So railway heritage, lots of different variations, but having these things linked together is very important, particularly at national and particularly at transnational level. It's important for tourism because it's very unlikely a tourist is going to travel some distance just to see one small site, but they will travel if there are a network of sites, a route of sites which are linked together. And these are important for telling the bigger story. Now, I've just downloaded a map of the, what we call the anchor points of the, um, uh, of the European route of industrial heritage. And you see there that it's a very dense concentration of these sort of key areas, which are gateway points to lots of other little sites. But again, you can look at this on the um, uh, on on the um, on the map of the um, of the industrial heritage route site. Now, why do I think this is relevant for Ironbridge and the day-to-day -day operations? of Ironbridge. Well, Ironbridge has been an important anchor point for this European route of industrial heritage since its creation. And of course, it's an anchor point. It's the, we, we say it's the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. So it's important that we're included. But we're included in different ways because it's not just the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. It's also the birthplace of the production of iron in a particular way using coke. It's also, it has important aspects to do with the ceramics industry and the production of pottery and porcelain. It's a, obviously been a coal mining site. It has transport links to sea. And then of course, there's the famous bridge itself, the iron bridge itself. So it's an important part of what we do is to tell the story of how we are linked with the rest of industry in the past and now through industrial heritage. So it places the Ironbridge site as part of a, a wider network, a wider transnational narrative, which let's remind people that we were all connected. The industrial world was connected through flows of production, through different techniques of production, through the goods which were exported, the goods which were imported, 
the objects which were produced and the communities which shared similar identities and similar ways of life. If we talk about coal mining, we can talk about similarities between communities in Taiwan, in Japan, in China, in, in Australia, in, in many parts of Europe, in, the, in North America. Everybody's bounded by the, the theme, coal mining. And there are links that we can talk about through trade and through colonial histories, good and bad, and of course, through contemporary travel. And I think this is important for Ironbridge because it makes Ironbridge feel as if it belongs to a wider community a and has a wider voice, a bigger voice in the world, in a sense. Now, I think this is a good strategic direction for Ironbridge to go forward in the future. The industrial route of industry, the, the European route of industrial heritage is a powerful marketing device for tourists. Cultural routes are very important for marketing purposes. And across the route, whether it's from a big site or a small site or a number of different sites, there are regular flows of ideas, projects, and partners. We have ready-made partners in the cultural route itself. This is really important for funding purposes because funding is very competitive. Partners are very important for funding. And as you know, the UK is now stands outside of Europe, but nevertheless, as part of a network, we can access European funds. We can't lead these networks, these, but we can be part of them. But also for heritage donors, it's much easier and much more sort of um, ready to, to be part of a cultural route, part of a wider framework to get money from a heritage donor than it is just for one particular site. And it gives us a stronger voice, both in policy terms and in political terms as well. Importantly, it helps our interpretation of our heritage. It helps tell the bigger story, how Ironbridge is not just a localized site, but how it connects to other parts of the world. The goods which were produced and made in Ironbridge using the various techniques were exported across the world. And this is a really important story to tell because it, it provides ready-made links for us to, to link together. I think cultural routes provide a good strategic direction for all types of cultural heritage, not just industrial heritage. Cultural routes are more important than ever because in the situation that we're in at the moment with pandemic, there's more emphasis on protectionism and new nationalisms, and we have to break those boundaries. We have to remind people that we were once linked in many different ways through our heritage, through the past, and we are still linked because we share this cultural heritage. So collaboration, cooperation in these is going to be needed for post COVID-19 recovery purposes on so many different levels. If we talk about protection and conservation, well, that relies on shared knowledge and expertise and building partnerships and cultural routes allow us to do that. Cultural routes give us what I call strength in number. They provide a critical mass. And that provides greater access to resources, to funding, and also to ideas. And the very fact that we're having this discussion now, and hopefully you will be having more of a discussion, is, 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 is important. 
critically, cultural roots bring meaning to heritage, to our cultural heritage. They tell us that these things weren't sort of cultural heritage sites weren't just built in isolation. They link up. They have a bigger story to tell. I just need to go to the the um, uh, the National Museum in Taipei and stand outside and look at the outside of the building and I see the influence of Roman architecture, of Greek architecture. I also see Japanese influence and inside I see French interiors. So you know, the, this is the story, this is a, a wider story than the in individual site. And I think um, uh, we need to think carefully about what connects our heritage. So I would ask you to think about these questions. What connects your heritage sites to other sites in Taiwan? And importantly, very importantly for a Taiwanese uh, event such as this, what connects sites to other parts of the world? And I know from my experience in Taiwan, there are many things that connect to different parts of the world. What commonalities, not differences, what commonalities can you identify and share to help build cultural roots and their global audiences, their, or certainly their transnational audiences? And how can you share your route with non-European audiences and new generations, the younger generations? How can you make it relevant and meaningful? And I put a little quotation there from um, Aristotle, who talks about the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And maybe in the future, for future generations, we need to aspire to a more transnational approach to our cultural heritage, which is embedded in the day-to-day -day operations of our individual sites, and which allows us to strategize and to think in a much more um, meaningful way about not just sustainability, but how we engage with one another in these very difficult times. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, as I say, I wish I could be there. I only wish I could be there in wonderful Taiwan, but hopefully in the near future, I hope to be so. Thank you very much.